Hi everybody, Kristen Hunter Thompson here from Dataspire to do a mini review of statistics. And this is for all of us as we're teaching in the education space to think of sort of what are the statistics that we might be getting our older students towards or those that are more advanced with working with data and their statistical knowledge. But it's good to have a sense of what those statistics are, even when we aren't actually teaching the statistics to our students, because it can help inform how we facilitate those interactions with data. So just as a reminder, when we're kind of thinking statistically, what does this actually involve? So we ask a statistical question, we ask a question that can be answered from data. So we need data collection, we need to visualize the data, we have data reduction in terms of only using the data that we need. We determine or we're sort of summarizing it, calculating things from it. We determine if what we're seeing in the data is by chance alone or if it is actually an indication of what's going on in the, in the phenomenon or the system that we're studying. And then we can make inferences from those data based on the phenomenon or the system or the, the sample that we've used we can use to make inferences. And this is just a general reminder that there is variation in every step along the way. So we need to think about that variation as we're answering our statistical questions. So just a quick reminder on some meanings, and this is sort of definition jargon, but it's good to keep in the back of our minds, is that a parameter is what technically we refer to as a number that summarizes or describes the entire population. So everything in the universe that exists in that space that we are studying that population that is a parameter a statistic technically is the number we calculate by taking a sample of that population and we use these terms even if it's the same numerical value for a parameter and a statistic but a statistic is what it is that we're talking about with this sample, which is just a good reminder that sampling actually drives everything that we do when we work with data and when we're asking statistical questions, because we can't, we always run up against limits of time and space and resources. We can't go out and sample the entire population the vast majority of the time. So we're talking, of, we're making conclusions and we're drawing these inferences and our students are making claims from a sample of the phenomenon of the population that's the phenomenon or the system that we're looking at and another sort of reminder at the beginning of a major underlying component of what's going on when we're looking at data and when we're making inferences from data is the central limit theorem which is um, sort of distilled down here in that if we have a large properly drawn sample so how do we draw that properly drawn sample is a whole other topic and that we could talk about later. Uh, but let's presume that we have a representative sample. It's going to resemble the population that it came from, if it's big enough and if it's representative of that population. So while there will be variation from individual sample to individual sample, it's really likely that any sample is going to hugely vary from the overall population that it came from. And this is, this is a law of numbers. <laughs> this, is, this is the central limit theorem is why this works out. Um, and this is really important because it influences what inferences we can draw. So if we have this large properly drawn sample that resembles our population, we can make, we can make some, some inferences or some different conclusions, which are if we know about the population, the entire population, then we can make inferences about the sample because the sample represents the population. If we know about the sample, so if we have the mean or the standard deviation of that sample, and we know that that sample is representative of the population, then we can make inferences about the population. If we know about the sample and the population, we can make inferences or we can infer from the sample what, that, that the sample is likely from that population, right? We can do that comparison. And if we know underlying characteristics of two samples from a population, then we can infer if they're likely or unlikely from the same population. And these general concepts of comparing two groups and having, one, having a set of data and we're trying to make inferences from it, it's a large part of what we're trying to go for with our students as they're making sense of data. 
Now, in no way am I saying that you should teach the central limit theorem to your students in middle school or maybe even high school. Um, but I think it's helpful for us to remember that this is a major underlying component of the vast majority of statistics that are commonly used. And just sort of a note that the central limit theorem needs a sample size of at least 30 to hold true. In general, gross over generalization, context dependent, but in general about 30, 30 a sample size of 30 is needed. Okay, so my last final note about statistics before we dive in is that no statistic Statistical test can be a substitute for common sense or qualitative knowledge on the part of whoever is analyzing the data. I think this is a really important reminder that Excel or Google Sheets or Systat or R or Python or whatever you're using can spit out a number at you, but you, the person receiving that number, actually has to think about whether or not it makes sense in the context and what you know about the system. And I think this is something that we all know, but that's really hard for our students in a day and age where computer programs can just spit numbers out at them and they don't really have that sense of what it is. Okay, so we've talked about um, measures of center before, but to start this review of different statistics, we've got standard deviation and standard error. So standard deviation is how spread out the values are from the underlying population mean. And standard error is how spread out the sample means are from an underlying population mean. So what does that mean? So if you have a population and you take five different samples from it, the means of those samples as it compares to the population mean is what the standard error is. The standard deviation is each of one of those individual data values from the population and how it compares to the population mean. This is a really easy way, numery statistic, for us to get a sense of how spread out are our data around the mean. What's interesting and sort of cool from a math side is that the standard error is the standard deviation of the sample means. If that went over your head, don't worry about it. Um, but basically, both of these have to do with how spread out are our data points from the population mean. Margin of error or confidence interval, as it's called. So a margin of error is where you take the upper bound and the lower bound of a confidence interval. The confidence interval, the easiest way to calculate it is one standard deviation above and below your mean. Um, and then that, because that gives us a sense if your population is, or if the sample that you have is normally distributed around your mean, or if you have lots of samples of, from that population, then the means of your samples will create a normal distribution. And so if we go one standard deviation away from our mean, then we know, again, based off, off of the math and how the numbers work out, that that encompasses about over 60% of the data values will fall within one standard deviation of the mean. If our confidence intervals do not overlap, between two, two groups, if we've plotted those confidence intervals for two different groups, then it's highly likely those groups are different. Because again, so many of our data values by probability are going to fall close to that mean. So if they're not falling close to the mean, if they're not within those confidence intervals, then it's highly likely those groups might be different. Do we know they're actually different? No, that's where common sense comes in. But signs point towards they're different. The trick is, if the confidence intervals do overlap between two groups, we cannot say that the opposite is true. We have no idea. It might be that our sample size isn't big enough. It might be that our, our numbers are biased in, in our sample. It might be that the groups are similar and therefore not different, but we can't, we can't definitively, we can't be so sure. We can't state with like a high likelihood that the groups are similar when the confidence intervals overlap. This is a tricky thing for students to get a sense of, but again, it comes back to science is probabilistic, not deterministic, right? We sort of, we say things are likely or unlikely or highly or less likely, things like that. Um, and some situations lead towards us being able to conclude that things are more highly likely, but the opposite isn't always the case with statistics. So this brings us to this fabulous thing of the p-value, which often gets spit out at us from different tests. And so I want to spend a little bit of time thinking about what the p-value is before we review some of the common statistical analyses that we might use. So 
Um, Alex Reinhardt says, a p-value is the probability under the assumption that there is no true effect or no true difference of collecting data that shows a difference equal to or more extreme than what you actually observed. Whew, that is a mouthful. So what does that actually mean? The p-value, it's a probability estimate. So it's not an exact number. It's based on probability of how likely it would be for you to get the same result of a difference between two groups or across a measure totally by chance alone. So when we have a p-value of 0 0.05, which is often a benchmark that we use in science, that means that there's, if your p equals 0 0.05, that there's a 5% chance that you would have gotten that result completely by chance alone, having nothing to do with the phenomenon or the system or the, or the treatment that you put into, into place. So it seems that there's likely there's an actual difference in these data, right? If there's only a 5% chance that it happened by chance alone, by like, who knows, like the wind blew in the wrong direction or this, the moon, you know, was in whatever phase it was in the sky, then that's a pretty good indication that there's an actual difference going on in your data based on what you did or what you looked at in your data. It's important to, this is a hard thing to kind of wrap your head around because p-value, there's many things that p-values aren't. It's just the probability of whether or not we'd get the same result by chance. Um, but often p-values are misrepresented in the media or our students, are, as they're sort of trying to wrap their head around what it actually means, we often kind of get jumbled and talk about it in funny ways. Um, so just as, a just as a reminder for all of us, the p-value is not the probability of the effect being real, that it actually shows something's going on in the population. It's not the probability that you found a relevant effect or a relevant result to what you're looking at. The p-value doesn't imply that you can be X percent certain that your treatment is effective. So for example, if you have a p-value of 0 0.05, that doesn't mean that your treatment is 95% that you're 95% certain that your treatment has an impact on the population. Or the p-value doesn't imply anything about the size of the association or the difference between your variables. It just tells you the probability of getting that same result of a difference between two things that you're comparing, two or more things that you're comparing, by chance alone. And this is a tricky thing for our uh, this can be a tricky thing for our students and all of us to understand. And so I think it's just helpful to sort of remember, like, what can, what is the p-value and what can we not actually say from the p-value? Um, and I challenge you to go out and read different media articles and see how they're talking about and representing p-values or sig statistically significant results, which is, when you have a p-value less than a pre-specified level, often it's 0 0.05 or 0 0.01 in science, how that's getting translated into prose to explain the research results to, to all of us. It's fascinating. Okay, so diving into some of the common statistical tests. So a t-test. We use a t-test to compare two means between, between two groups to see if they're statistically different from each other. We use it to determine the likelihood that the difference between those two means happens because of chance or because of the variable that you've tested. And comparing how much, you know, but what's important is that there are some assumptions that go in to doing a t-test. So your data need to be between those two groups. You need to have a somewhat similar spread of the variation within your data in order to run a t-test. And ideally, that spread is a normal distribution across, uh, around the mean for each of the groups. Now, what that mean is and exactly how big the variation is obviously does not have to be similar across the two groups. But what you don't want is one, one group that has a normal distribution and one group that has a really less skewed distribution. That would mean that you would not meet one of the assumptions of doing a t-test. And part of that is because comparing how much data, how much your data scatter there is for each variable and then comparing the different means in relation to that data scatter so that the likelihood of the difference between the means is due to how likely it is that that difference between the means across your two groups is due to random chance, chance alone can be determined. That's actually what the t-test is trying to do. So if, you're, if the spread of your two, of your two groups
is really is really different in terms of their shape, um, then it it creates some kind of wonky components and the the algorithm of a t-test isn't able to function the way it's meant to function. So line of best fit or regression is another common thing that we use with our students. And it's a way of visualizing how change in one variable, let's say on the x-axis, may be accompanied by a change in the other variable, let's say on the y-axis. And when we, when we plot a line of best fit, what we're trying to do is determine what's the best average line to fit through this data set? Um, so by average, it's sort of, how can we kind of best sense of like, in general, half of our data points or values or like the half are above and that half are below. Um, it's, not an it's not a median, but you know, sort of on average, where does that line fall? Um, and the closer the points are to the line, then the better that that line models the relationship between the variables because that line is actually a model. We can create the algorithm, the equation for that line to get a sense of when X changes in whatever step, what does that mean for a resulting change in Y for that to be able to kind of predict or get a better sense to quantify what that relationship is. We call it a correlation if it's a linear relationship, but otherwise we're looking at relationships across any two different quantitative numerical variables values that we're looking at. So this leads to the correlation coefficient or an R squared value. And what these are is a correlation coefficient measures just how good that the average is, that line is uh, among your data points. So how close those data points fit to that line of best fit. And when the value is closer to one or closer to negative one, then those values are right on the line if it's one or negative one, meaning for every step, for every step on the x-axis, there's an equal change in the y-axis. And it's one if it's a positive relationship as x increases, y increases. It would be towards negative one if it's a negative relationship. So as every increase in x, there's a decrease in y of the same of the same value. But because those can be, because we can have negative, well, we can have a negative co correlation coefficient, right? Because we can have a negative relationship between our variables. We square it to create an R squared value, which gives us a sense of how much variation around the mean is explained by differences in the Y axis variable. And so if we think about this, um, as we move over on the X, how much does Y change? That's how we're, that's just, that's how we've grounded this statistic in our thinking. And part of that um, is really nice because it builds off of the convention that in the Western Hemisphere we read left to right. So we're thinking along change along the x-axis and what that results for change along the y-axis. If you have more than two variables, it's still, um, it's still similar. It's sort of a change in one variable and how does that relate to changes in the other? How much can, how much can be explained? of the change in that subsequent variable from the initial variable. So the other important thing is that R squared gives us some guidance as to how, what kind of hedging language we can use when we talk about the relationship between two variables. If these data points are really spread out, then we're gonna have a lower R squared value. And what that means is that we have, you know, these two variables have a lower exp explanatory relationship than if the two than if the points were really close to the line. So rather than saying, you know, only 10%, if, if we have an R squared value of 0 0.1, then we can say that 10% of the change in Y is due to a change in X or is related to a change in X. That's not a lot, that's not a lot of confidence that we have that that's important. With the major caveat being if it's a system where a 10% change in one variable caused by another is, is relevant and important, then by all means that R squared value might be important. But in general, a 10% um, explanation or determination of the relationship isn't all that explanatory or helpful. Whereas if we could say that 90% of the change in Y is is related to a change in X, then that gives us a far better sense or far more confidence or that we're more likely to think that there's a strong relationship 
between X and Y. And this is where I jump in and remember the caveat that correlation doesn't mean causation. So just because two vary, just because we can calculate our correlation coefficients and we can get a high R squared value, that doesn't mean anything. We have to think back to Alberto Cairo's quote at the beginning of this review that we have to think about what the number actually means. <laughs> and if those, if there's no like common sense reason that those two variables would relate to each other, then it doesn't matter if we have a high R squared value. Um, so that's where that, that common sense comes in to make sense of our numbers. So finally looking at an ANOVA. Um, so we use an ANOVA when we have several different treatments that we are testing or if we have two or more, or sort of more than two treatments that we're looking at. So with the t-test, we just have you know, treatment control. We have two groups that we are looking at. But if we have, you know, if we have a control, a treatment variation A and a treatment variation B, then, then we need to use an ANOVA because we have more than two groups that we're comparing. But all of the assumptions that we had to meet for a t-test apply to an ANOVA. So the variation within each of the groups needs to have similar shapes across the groups, among the groups. And ideally, the, the distribution, the shape of the variation within each group is a normal distribution. Another component of an ANOVA is that the treatments have to be either nominal or ordinal category type data. And this has to do with how you're running through. So we use ANOVAs when we have, um, we use a correl, you know, we look for correlation when we have two numerical values, variables that we're looking at. We, we use an ANOVA when we have a categorical, and that categorical can be nominal or ordinal, uh, but it's not just two numerical variables that we're looking at. What we're trying to do is analyze how much of the data that you see in that, in that overlap is in relation to the total amount of data scatter. So like any difference across these groups, how much of it is due to the total amount of data scatter that we have. And, um, and what an ANOVA gives us is that sense of if there's a difference, but it doesn't tell us where the difference lies. Remember, because we have more than two groups. And so that's why you need to do post hoc tests to determine which of the difference is significant. So thinking back to the example I gave is like, is that difference between the control and treatment variation A? Is it between the control and treatment variation B? Or is it between treatment variation A and treatment variation B? That's what the post hoc test allow us to do is to figure out what the difference is, like where the difference lies. But the ANOVA gives us a sense of if there's a difference based on chance, like if there's a difference in the data, most likely, or if it's likely that the difference we're seeing in the data as we're plotting it is just from chance alone. So just a reminder, data literacy are these many things, the ability to collect, organize, visualize, interpret, analyze, and share data for yourself and others to use and understand. Statistic plays a role largely, as we've been talking about in this review, in the visualize, interpret, and analyze your data. Um, but really, as I talked about with regards to the p-value, it, it also influences how we share our data and what we communicate from our data as well, because what that sample is and how we're making conclusions from that sample really influences how we can talk, what conclusions we can draw and how we can talk about our inferences. If this has felt like a lot and you're really excited to jump in and learn more, here are some resources that I can suggest that you check out, as well as there are more resources on the, on the website at dataspire.org under, data, under um, our data literacy resources. So I encourage you to check those out. And thank you so much for joining me on this really quick, really truncated review of, of some statistical analyses that we use in the education space. Thank you. Have a good day.